Welcome back to the Two and a Half Coaches podcast for episode seven. So we thought we'd just mix it up so we'll have some of our longer episodes and we'll have like a few mini topics within there as well. Yep. Um, so this will just be a little mini one where Isaac's just going to dive in a little bit more. He's put up articles and stuff recently about the agility program design. Obviously something that he's done a lot of work with over the last, well, he's obviously used it, but a lot more work in terms of promoting the content and stuff um, <laughs> over the last what would you say, six months has yeah, really pushed so. it? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we're going to dive a little bit deeper. Obviously, you can only go through so much context on an Instagram post and people probably don't swipe all the way across. Uh, we'll read it. So, <laughs> if you do want to get some value, stick around. <laughs> um, so, starting off, um, what's your, like, overall philosophy in terms of designing agility programs? Like, yeah, obviously, so you know, where do agility ladders fit in? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think it's just that whole like breakdown of like change of direction and agility and like obviously both having their place. They're both vitally important. You want to define. So change of direction is like that controlled, like perfect analogy, put some cones down, run through, have a structured line of where you're running to. Mm -hmm. And I see that very much as like the, I'm not sure how to kind of break it down a bit more. So, but it's very much the physical quality of it, mm. right? Because obviously the, we separate the two. There's that cognitive side. There's the, the actual visual perception of I see someone, I see what pace they're coming towards me and then, then I'm trying to pre-plan what's kind of happening or automatically kind of plan it and then we've got that structure change direction. So it's great in the early stages in terms of like a load demand as well. Yeah. So obviously chaotic training has its unstructured demands on the system and if we haven't actually got quality changes in direction, it can make it hard to piece the two together. Yeah. Um, but then we obviously have that agility side of things so that's obviously adding in that layer of cognitive demand that's probably like the key point. And then it's also like defining what kind of agility are we doing? Because you see the most common, that's where like it kind of got sparked in me. It's like you see all the like return and play agility work and someone's running towards you and then you point your arm out to the side and they go. And it's like we, there is an element of specificity when it comes to agility and like the, the processing side of things, of you seeing something, them throwing their arm out and then you're trying to plan what's going on versus especially like an attacking scenario, you're in control of the situation. Mm. So if you're heading towards a defender, you can manipulate what they do a fair bit by what pace you do. Are you on their inside? Are you on their outside? Are you going to hit a goosey or shuffle or whatever it is? You manipulate the scenario a fair bit. So I see those as two, again, have their places. Mm. But that's why I've tried to dig a bit deeper into that cognitive, both defensive and attacking kind of agility uh, situations which I think is look at our group and the drills we've been able to build with them mm. their processing abilities and it's actually transferring mm. which is one of the bigger ones we always talk about is I know as SNCs we're meant to stay a bit more GPP to get that broad base of things etc but there is that blend where we can see some transfer happening and if we're actually going to push transfer it's got to transfer mm. it can't just be like oh we're doing something that looks like it and then hopefully that makes changes yeah. um so that's where the whole thought process idea principles are kind of coming from. Um, and then we're just exploring more and more and, and grabbing, obviously you've got change direction, you've got forms of early stage agility or I guess controlled agility. Yeah. And then you've got the unstructured agility. Um, but you've in the same sense of any element of a program, you've got principles yeah. and how you design those. And I think that's where, I think if we can lay out, so that's what I, I'm very principle based as we all are. So if you can pull out those principles and just put it on in front of a topic, it makes it so simple. Whereas like a lot of people will see the jewels that we've put up and they're like, oh, that looks really sick. I'm going to copy it. But how do you design it? Yeah. And I think that's the big part. And that's something that we're going to try and bring out over the next couple of months is like a, a little mini program design course. Yep. So running through all the steps and the thought processes and how we build it and how we design it. Mm. So then you've got all those laying principles there. So then you can go grab your group. Could be two, could be 20. And then you can design an agility-based program in respect to everything else in your program and see results. And within the yeah. coaching context as well and what Absolutely. you have available and Absolutely. skill level and all that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. So essentially you view like change of direction and agility on almost like a continuum where you've got change of direction at one end, which is like completely controlled. Yeah. I'm hitting this cone, I'm going this direction. And then we have like pure, like pure agility on the other end where it's like more, much more game-like scenarios you're reacting completely in an uncontrolled game environment speed style and yeah. then you have like somewhere in the middle ground where you've got like you're still reacting to a stimulus but it might not be like specific to yeah. the sport 
yep. um, in terms of it's like pointing rather than reacting to the movement of a body. Yep. So we're like working along that spectrum. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking purely on this like more the right hand side of that spectrum in the pure agility sense, you put up a post yesterday with like six principles. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about principles, number one being drill size. Um, so do you want to dive deeper into that? Yeah, for sure. So it's, it, it's pretty much with like most elements of like a field program the sizing of which you're working in will obviously influence a lot of the general physical qualities that are happening. Yeah. So if we can think, if we, like, we've written this out on the boards before where we've got, like, think of, like, a GPS. You've got acceleration, deceleration, top speed, um, cuts, impacts, all those kind of things. So from a smaller spacing, and then obviously you add in that cognitive side, which is obviously very hard to measure, um, we can usually start with our drills like a three-by-three. So you're literally getting like half a step before you can make a change of direction, but you're just you're getting that initial thought process of things. And that's how you've got to think about when you add in these exercises, what kind of stresses and demand. So if you like I put in the picture there, there's like a little three by three, you might pass the footy to the other person, whoever it might be, and then make a change in direction. There's no speed. The processing time is going to be a much easier to process because you know exactly where they are. They've got no speed or anything like that. So it's a good starting point. And then you're getting feedback in terms of like success, failures, etc. And then if we open up to like a 15 by 15, let's say either person starts on a corner, you've then got, all right, am I going to sprint towards the corner? Am I going to sprint? They overcommit, I'm going to cut back on the inside. And then you start to paint pictures of like scenarios because that's all you want to do is like the like successful, like uh, I guess the successful reps as you go through is what's relaying that confidence like we spoke about in the previous one. So keeping in mind the sizing at which you work in will obviously dictate like where you start, mm -hmm. the processing demands and then how much speed, top speed, etc. Because mm -hmm. if I do a 15 by 15, I'm starting to accumulate a little bit of speed so then that affects how much speed I put in the session, yeah. potentially even a little bit of conditioning demands from how many reps we do. So mm. it's just opening that up. Yeah, so then that the size of the drill, number one, is probably going to dictate like energy system demand, mm -hmm. um, what target tissue is going to get loaded the most, and then the considerations going into the rest of the training session itself, but also your overall like plan for the week. Um, like if you've got a lot of like sharp sh cuts in a smaller space, cool, like that's going to be a lot more load on like adductors and ankles and stuff like that versus mm -hmm. if it's going to be a lot more open space where you're going to be hitting a bit more top speed, considerations for like hamstrings and that kind of thing mm -hmm. and then you kind of touched on point two already like in terms of drill entry mm -hmm. um so not only can we can manipulate the size of the grid or space that you're playing with we can also manipulate drill entry so you want to dive yeah. further into that so you obviously just again these are all kind of progressions you can build in or where you can start so, so i kind of put in the post there's like you got to know your group and obviously if someone's done if they're quite uh, competent in the agility work we're probably not going to start with just a little stagnant static three by three or something like that so the way which you enter the drill is obviously going to add extra layers of like i like the analogy of like you're painting a picture and obviously the more of the picture you can paint in the, the clearer the picture you're going to get so we're trying to color in those edges of what challenges and demand so if i have a rolling start i'm starting with a lot more speed so then there's obviously that little bit of fear element in terms of like i'm at high speed is there obviously a collision involved in this as well? So we can start to practice that. And then obviously where we start our rolling start from. So it could start from a curve. So if you're starting from a curve, you're hitting the entry after your curve, mm -hmm. you're already a little bit off balance. So there's an element of like controlling your entire system to then make a change in direction. So you're getting used to these different pictures. Um, so you've obviously got like the speed, the processing side of things. And then there's obviously again that cognitive side. So we've added in a few bits and pieces where just weighing it up a little bit but like the turn and react so we've got some of those drills where there's a defender or there's an attacker facing away from the drill the defender can start wherever they want and then they've got to turn and go change the direction and beat the defender so there's they're practicing that real sharp processing side of things and that thought process because a lot of people it, it kind of runs back to like stress physiology it's like that fight flight or freeze it's like if you turn and you're seeing someone in front of you, depending on, again, the stress demands on that, you might fight and try and go through contact, yeah. flight, try to run around, or a lot of people just freeze because they've never been exposed to it. Yeah. So they'll freeze and just go into soft contact or 
I'll kind of just give the ball away or whatever. So we can practice that processing side of things. Which kind of leads into the next point that you had, which was time to decision making. So then we can um, not only like introduce like a turn and react kind of situation, but you can manipulate how close that defender is to the offensive player yep. and then like how much time they have to then make a decision. So we can dive yep. deeper into how you'd manipulate that. Um, and there, yeah, there's many different ways we can go about that. So there's, there's obviously like when you're getting a bit more of a building, when you're getting a bit more of a run up, you're getting a bit more of a sense of how they're moving, where they're going, what's going on. So you're a little bit more in control of that processing side of things. As we start to get closer together and we add in more turn and react and then this is where we kind of add in like those second layers where it's like they might beat the first offender but that within half a metre or two metres, like we spoke about Phil on the last podcast, like his ability to beat one immediately sense where space is beat the second immediately find more space mm-hmm. that's based off like r- like half a second of decision making so by practicing how quickly you can make a decision and again that's backwards all the way to that continuum where you've got the physical qualities of you're strong you're agile you've got um uh, what's the words uh like you've got all the physical qualities down packed um let me try the word but your ability to like react to a defender or yeah, like, like you've the perception. Reactivity, so. element side of things, but they're also strong, all those kind of things. Like you've got the underlying physical qualities, actually do it. But then if you add in that time processing side of things, it's quite impressive what individuals can do mm. um, to then get away from their defender or go through and whatever it might be. Yeah. And then one of the other things that we talk about, like how you enter the drill, but then you can also bias certain physical qualities or certain situations by manipulating how they exit the drill as well yeah 100 percent. so which would be yeah that next point of like drill exits and uh, we kind of found it was like we were opening up a lot of these drills and scenarios and things like that and they would just have like an open line and you can see if there were half a chance of getting around that they just cruise through or whatever yeah. it might be so we're trying to think about ways of like how do you ingrain because that's one of the hardest parts is like when you get into space it's a little bit if anyone's played sport you get into space it's a little bit like ah what do I do now? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there needs to be that ingrain of like backing your pace and mm. and that curvature running ability, which comes from change of direction training, like that confidence that if you get half a break, you feel confident to attack space. Yeah. So by having set up direct exits and they've got, I guess, uh, what's the point? Like just points or anchors to focus on. Like they know before the drill starts, mm. even if it's a turn and react, they've got these anchor points to know they know where they're going. So let's say they've got two left and right. They beat the first offender and they see someone on their left-hand side. I'm going straight for that side. Yep. Mm. So we've just constrained that drill quite well to then get that response out. So then when they see half a gap, I'm going to go for that space. Mm. The defender's on the right-hand side. Or I'm going to have to step in and go back in. I'm going to hit the curve and run around the outside. Mm. So we can we can manipulate it that way. Yeah. And then, like, the last thing to manipulate would then be, like, the number of decisions that they make as well. Yeah. Um, so whether they're beating one defender they have an anchor point, I still got to get around a second because like you said, some people get that initial space and they're like, shit, now I'm going to do this again, mm. freeze up, get hit, lose that momentum that they've just gained. Yep. So it's like manipulating that can then help them attack space but then also with the confidence to then try find more space again, like someone like a Phil who has that ability. Mm. Um, so you want to speak further on like how you would maybe manipulate that to bias certain – would you? do it more towards like specific scenarios or you're keeping it relatively random in terms of how yeah, you introduce the number of reactions? A little bit less like sports scenarios and more just like trying to get that outcome of like where it is and you, you like we, I think it might be next point, like the success rate, like you've got to manipulate it to the point where you know they're going to be A, challenged, but B, there's got to be some success because they've got to obviously fail at some point as well. So like you'll get that first change of direction. The first one's usually within five to ten metres and then it just depends on what are the secondary stress as well. So if we get past that first offender, then we open up into like a 20 by 20 meter space. We're going to get some speed dose in there as well. Yeah. So if, if, if we're wanting to cover over a couple of qualities, we can add them up. But then also the from that, again, time to decision, that processing side of things, if we keep it quite short, there's less time to overthink. Mm. So then they're, they're getting used to just hitting, whacking, going, stepping, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and it comes with a lot of practice. So... It depends on again on those secondary qualities you're wanting to build or what you're not wanting to overdose on, mm. on. Um, but where you'd set up that secondary layer, and we can always get that's what we were playing around with the other week is you can get your secondary layer to come in at different times. Yeah. 
So you can have a secondary layer that's a static and standing there, you know they're coming. We added that drilling the other week. We put it up and it was like, this. there's two people starting close together and they're yeah. going around opposite poles. Mm. And then there's a second person entering to the drill, like running around the drill. Yeah. Mm. So you're like, I know someone's there. I can't see them. But I'm going to either attack space or I'm going to... And you, you start and like, like we spoke about in the last podcast, like 360 degree sports, like AFL and soccer. You're getting this perceptual awareness where bodies are what pace they're traveling at, where they're coming from. And then you can really start to manipulate your decision making based on that. Mm. And it was, it was cool to see where like some people just getting through really fast and then just back in that pace. Some, some people go against down. Keith and they're overcommitting <laughs> and going back on the inside. But like, it, it's like they get those many different pictures. Mm. And again, they build up that, those successful reps then they're mm. in a good position. As a defender yeah. as well, you guys are working good qualities too. Yeah. And that, like that's the other side of the coin yeah. is like the defensive side as well. So, yeah, like being able to actually track properly and that's probably our next thought process is probably we'll do a little bit more towards the back end of um, like the off seasons, adding the contact because yeah. it's all great to do touch footy and which is we're, we're building more of that processing side of things. But when you add in a contact layer, it's going to be completely oh, different. Yeah. So we had that with the return of contact boys when they were doing 2v1s and yeah. et cetera and opening up to a bit more agility it, when you've got that ability to defend someone or step or hit half a shoulder that then also builds more confidence as well mm. so and, and contextualizes everything that they've just built from that perception point to a bit more sport specific absolutely and because then you again whenever you're adding contact you add that fear element as well because yeah. mm. every you watch people that are a little bit fearful in contact will be hesitant in a contact scenario yeah. mm. touch footy scenario it's a little bit easier they'll just go through and make the touch yeah. but at least you've got to get your feet in the right position then you're starting to be like, this guy's about to whack me, step me, what's going to happen here? Do I try and close the space? Whatever it is. So yeah. um, that's cool. That's what we try to do at like the clubs where it's like mm. that pre-season kind of off-season kind of work where we can integrate a few qualities together mm. um, in consideration for what the coaches are trying to achieve in their sessions. Mm. But we can work with the head coaches and go, all right, sweet, we need to work on edge defense. Sweet, give me 2v3 or 1v2 or whatever it might be. I'll give you an agility scenario, whatever it might be, and we can start to blend them together. Yeah. And that's where, like, again, we come back to this communication side of things all the time, but it's like this is where we can actually really wear, like, really paint this picture and paint this grey area between strength and conditioning and the sport itself is, like, having these conversations with the coaches, like, what scenarios are the athletes struggling in? Is this a physical problem? Is this a tactical problem? Is this, like, a skill problem or is it... They just don't have enough context and they haven't had enough practice in those situations. So it's just like, all right, as as the sport coach, I'm planning to do X drill, sweet. Here's some agility drills that we can implement just prior to that, which is going to start to contextualise, A, the physical qualities, but then also the situations so that when you go into a bit more of a specific breakdown with the sport and with the sport coaches, oh, sweet, like they have a better idea of how to position themselves, how to react to those situations and that just just makes every like everything gets better from that point. Yeah, yeah, and that's when the sessions start to flow really well. And you're actually trying to get because that is the whole purpose of training mm. is to in training on those Tuesdays and Thursdays to pull out things that you're actually going to see in the game. And when you you blend in the tactical side of things and what you're trying to achieve with those physical development side of things, you can get a lot of success. And that's mm. that's where you can start to make real quick changes in teams and in players. Um, and actually make a big influence because, again, we can uh, found I uh, again spoke to like one of the SNCs from when they were here, the Blues ones. Is that they did a big off season where they just ran laps and ran, 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 and then they get to preseason and the conditioning relative to what they were doing just wasn't transferring. Mm, yeah. So it's like we need those separate qualities from a top up perspective, but then we need to blend it. Well, I think it's going if everyone, we've got the everyone knows that the difference between game fit and like yeah, just general yeah. running fit, like. I distinctly remember like one of one of the off seasons that I did where I was like genuinely the fittest I'd ever been. Like I was out running like most guys at preseason, like I felt so good and then got to that first preseason training session mm. and I was gassed in like yeah. five minutes. So I was like, What the fuck? Like we've done one drill, like I've gone up and down the court twice, like what in the hell is going on? Like I was running rings around these guys in off season, like mm. so it's just like yeah, as much as those physical qualities are important, we need to be able to contextualise it and have a little bit more of that specific dose, which is super important. Yeah. Which is hard because that's, that's again, a bit separate topics, mm. but it's like you're, you're pulling out doses of separate qualities and there's there's 
practicing, which can re- allow a higher volume. Yeah. And then there's actual expression of what you're trying to achieve. So it's like yeah. when we do these agility drills, there's not a lot of reps. We can't do a lot of reps because the demand on the system is quite high. The intensity is fucking high. Absolutely. So it's like even the more we do it, the more we're like, all right, let's really break this drill down so they know exactly what they need to do. Mm. So we're not wasting three drills that is stress on the system that's not getting an outcome. And then we only get one or two. And that's where you can all the reps. bring it back to those principles that we've just talked about. But it's just like, cool, I want to get more reps so they get more exposure from like the perception side of things. So let's decrease the drill size. Yeah. We're going to have less stress on this. So, or we're just going to give them less space to like stress themselves. So it's like, all right, sweet, they're actually getting better at this. But now we want to layer in those other physical qualities, make it a bit more contextual to a game, increase the size of drill, add defenders, like whatever it is, add contact. Yeah. Um, so this is where like having those underlying principles that we've just spoken about then helps to paint that picture of like how I'm going to formulate that training session, how I'm going to try to tick off. And it's just like, don't just look at Isaac's Instagram and go, that drill looks pretty cool. I'm going to do that. It's like, understand why, understand the principles behind it and how you can then take that drill to your situation. Is that drill appropriate? And like use that, the videos there as inspiration for how to use these principles and create the right drill for your context. Especially for different sports, because a lot of what we use is for rugby. But we've got some other sports that are in there as well. But like you use them, like in basketball, if people have used them in AFL, a bit like etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. The, the principles spread out across all the sports. Mm. So if you can grab those, then yeah, you're going to be yeah. in a good position to adjust to to adjust it, no matter what the sport is. Yeah, yeah. like even something as simple as like taking it to basketball, or even like you do like doing just a just no ball, and it's just purely like a ta- game of tag almost, yeah. and then putting a rugby ball in their hands and then they have to make a decision or a pass mm-hmm. it's the same with basketball it's like we can do this in like th- again that kind of almost adds another layer to that continuum but it's like we've got the we've got that reactionary component but it's just purely just physical like i'm trying to just just a game of tag i'm manipulating those mm-hmm. principles but then i can add in all right i got a dribble and then do that same movement but i'm adding in a dribble move and then this is where we can layer in the defense side of things like how do you not get faked out and how do you watch the right part of the offensive player's body yeah. that you're not following the ball and getting like caught up in like trying to follow the ball because that's what they're using to try to fake you out mm-hmm. um and then like you layer in that last component of like all right how do you like in terms of exiting the drill like in basketball we can exit the drill in terms of just getting around someone and running through a space we can exit the drill by trying to finish at the rim mm-hmm. we can exit the drill by trying to get a shot off like mm-hmm that's when like it becomes so much more contextual to the sport but again we've got these underlying principles and how i use these principles rather than going oh well that's a drill for rugby i can't use that it's mm, like, yeah. okay cool i like to see how the bodies are moving in that drill what physical qualities were ticking off how can i then contextualize that to basketball and then get the required adaptations that are going to help my athletes yeah 100% All right, wrapping it up with the <laughs> success rate so as much as we want to um, do all these drills and everything we need to balance obviously um the amount that they succeed to build confidence but we also want to challenge it to a point where they are failing as well yep. um they're not going to get better by just doing a drill that they're going to easily win every time so like how do you view that in the way that you want to um like how do you balance that success versus failure and how they then take that confidence into their sport yeah i think it's, it's a couple things. obviously like the success rate's a big one that's so what I put in there is like that that sweet spot of like 60 to 80%. It's kind of like a good mark because there's enough failures to learn that there's enough successes to build confidence above the, the amount of failures that they get. Yeah. Uh, but it's going to be quite clear in terms of, especially for our group's pretty good now because they'll, they'll turn around and be like, it's not working. Yeah. Or this is too easy. Like you can kind of see and yeah. if they score a try in every single one, it's too easy. Yeah. If there's nothing being scored, like it's too hard. So they're your pretty simple, just what are the results happening from each rep? Yeah. As long as they're obviously their intent is there, but then that intent is obviously influenced by, mm. is there half a chance? Yeah. Mm. Is there an actual opportunity? What's on the line? Is it, because again, you do it without a 40 versus with just them holding a 40, it's a completely different thing. Yeah. So having that success rate side of things, but then like we already spoke about, it's just, and it's not just those five previously, there's a few more on top of that, but like you just look at that success rate and then you just, go back across those five or so and go, all right, what can I change? Mm. Drill size, how many entries, how many defenders, what's happening? Yeah. And you can move and mould your, what stress is happening during the week. Do we need a speed exposure? We don't want a speed exposure because they've already done speed, whatever they've done with their coach or early in the week or whatever it might be. 
Um, but that that's your like rock in terms of like what is hap- how much is winning, yeah. how much success rate, and then also like what how are they getting there to be successful? Mm. Like, uh, are they actually evading the defender that's going to be efficient, or is it like just because the draw is a little bit too easy that they're evading? the defender if that makes sense yeah. so you just got to self-analyze your drill and make sure if we push this across to a game scenario or even a training scenario like team stuff will this see this carry over mm. um which is hard because that's where you've got to add those layers a bit more like a 2v1 or a 1v1 versus two defenders it's different when there's other bodies either side of them as well yeah mm. so you just got to keep those considerations in and you just keep adding your layers and layers and layers and you keep adding, you constrain it enough to get that success rate. Yeah. Yeah. So in wrapping this up, um, we'll go through each of these. So you got number one is drill size. Mm-hmm. Um, so starting from whether you're doing a small space, medium space, big space. Um, and then number two is drill entries. So whether they're starting, coming in off a curve, starting stationary, starting from the side, starting from the middle. Um, number three, time to decision making. So essentially, how close that defense is to where the offense is entering the drill. Um, and then number four, we've got the drill exits. Um, so whether you're just giving them open space to just finish across a the line, they have to finish at a certain point. Um, and then number of decisions to be made is number five. Um, so whether they're just beating one defender, beating two defenders, um, whether they have to like try pass to a player or something. And then finally, as we just spoke about, the success rate. Um, where we just have a general rule of you want to be more successful than you are failing, so winning more than you're losing. Yep. Um, but then also asking yourself that question and reflecting is like, are they winning more than they're losing because it's too easy? Are they losing because it's too hard? Or they just need to have a better understanding of what the drill is. Um, and that's where the beauty and art of coaching comes in. Um, do you have anything else at closing, Isaac? Uh, not that I can think of. Um it's just obviously going to take practice. It's just something we're moulding and adjusting. And we've had weeks where we've gone down and made drills and it's been shit. Yeah. Like genuinely, it's just, it hasn't worked. So we've had to mould and adjust on the fly. Um, but it's also just been a nice progressive build with the group that we have there. Uh, and obviously within the teams, it makes it a little bit easier. We can get that consistency of who's coming down, numbers and stuff like that. Uh, but it's definitely just practice. You've got to practice it. Uh, and like any art of coaching, like you've already said, it's just that ability to mould on the fly. Mm. So as you set them up, you, you can use these as frameworks, but just use that again. Just look at your group and think, oh, can I adjust this? Can I change this? And just have that license of freedom to yeah. to adjust it. But each time you're coming, again, you're coming back to those core principles of like, how did I design this drill in the first place and versus if you just took a drill off your Instagram and then try to implement it and it doesn't work, you're like, shit, what do I do now? Yeah. Versus if you actually understand the underlying principles behind that drill, then you go, okay, sweet, that didn't work because of X, Y, Z. Let me just manipulate the entry, manipulate the size of the drill, blah, blah, get the outcome we want rather than just trying to copy and paste um, of what you see. Yeah. But in closing, if you are not already po- following Isaac on Instagram, make sure you follow Isaac on Instagram and keep updated with Perform HQ as well because we'll be releasing that agility program design course in the near future. Sweet. Any closing words? Closing words, Keith? Uh-huh. Yeah. That was pretty good. You didn't say too much. <laughs> I was just I'll honestly just listening. I'm actually very intrigued. But obviously, <laughs> I do. No, but honestly, like I, I've done this with you since the beginning when we first started, and obviously, like all of it coming together now, it's like it's real intriguing. Mm. And like so much to learn still, mm. and like seeing it all come together now, it's like holy shit! Like it's actually kind of working because you watch those guys. Some of them when they first started with us to now, some of their evasive skills are incredible. Like someone like Jamie or like Rach even. Rage has been smoking some guys down the field recently and just taking yeah. their ankles. I'm like, damn, all right, hold up. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, but. Yeah, you used really to be like pretty confident in the defender in the drill and now you're like, no, 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 no. I don't I defend don't need, anymore. I don't need Rage. I don't need Rage <laughs> telling me how many times she stepped me. <laughs> yeah. nah, but shout out Rachel Lowndes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you for listening. That's and if you have any other topics that you'd like us to dive into, just like just a short <laughs> little podcast on just a very specific topic, um, let us know. We'd be more than happy to get into that. And as Keith said, we're doing a Q&A next week. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so stay tuned for that. Yeah. Get on Keith's Instagram and ask him some questions. Thank you. See you later. <laughs>